Good morning. My name is David. Welcome to week 47 of 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. If this is your first time checking out the channel, this is a one-year spiritual challenge as we go to a different church each week. So if you want to join along and this sounds like it's down your alley, make sure to like and subscribe. Always appreciate the support. For today, I'm in downtown Salt Lake City, which holy macaroni, this, this city is amazing. Uh, I'm going to be heading out pretty soon for the Conference Center for the 193rd Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So you may be wondering based off the title, what in the world is a lifetime Protestant doing going to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints General Conference? Well, it's a long story. If you've been following my 52 and 52 journey, uh, the very first week I went to uh, what I, at the time I called a Mormon church, um, I didn't know anything about Latter-day Saints. I didn't even know what a Latter-day Saint was. Just hours before I had learned who Joseph Smith was, Golden Plates, this angel Moroni. It was all very new to me. And when I walked into my very first LDS ward, I was shocked at the kindness, uh, the fruits of the members. Eventually I got talking with the missionaries and we just, I had so many questions. And by the time I left, I was on information overload. Like I couldn't keep doing LDS churches, so I've gone to some other Book of Mormon believing restoration churches. And same thing, I've gone to Community of Christ, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Strangite Church, very smaller compared to the lar much larger LDS Utah based church. But again, the people that I would meet there, just salt of the earth type of people. For this visit, I'm about to head in pretty soon here. Um, I, I'm just curious, uh, see what this is all about. I've been gifted uh, some tickets uh, from some amazing Latter-day Saints. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going in as a guest, I'm going in as a visitor, and I uh, want to be as respectful as possible. So I'm about to head in, so I'll be back in a moment.
Got back from Salt Lake City, and I am still paging through my thoughts as to everything that happened. Uh, I mentioned previously, the first time I walked off an LDS ward, I was on information overload. Here, like, I am, like, it's reach max capacity. Like, there is just so much insights and takeaways. Like, it's like this uh, F5 tornado in my head. All I have is this little whimsy net that I'm trying to catch all these thoughts down with. And as much as I try and write down notes and do post-it notes as to make some type of overview, some type of recap that's going to be linear and well thought out, I, I may just, I found where I'm just going to just, bleh, you know, just get this all out. Because one of the biggest contrasts that I saw that really kind of did a mind bend as to everything that I witnessed was the stark contrast between what was going on outside with the protests, with the yelling, the screaming, the insults, a type of camp that I have not, not this type of toxicity, but to be in the same label camp, if you want to call it that, as that side. And then to walk with the Latter-day Saints inside and to see that persecution, but to be handled in such a Christ-like manner, uh, really, uh, really, I I've gained so much more respect and insight into the dedication of Latter-day Saints. And with the protests, it, to me, it wasn't, it was almost like doing the opposite effect. Because to me, it was actually reinforcing the Book of Mormon. What do I mean by that? I'll try to expand on that in a moment. But when you walked inside, it was just so much different because everything was much more structured, organized, excitable, um, even, even uh, I would say sanitized. Like I walked into this uh, restroom on the third floor and it's like nobody was up there because it was so far away. And even the bathroom was polished and like pristine. And like there was a, a janitor in there and he was just scrubbing and cleaning every little detail inside. And I even felt weird to turn on the water because I knew that any type of water droplets that'd be inside the sink, he was going to clean that up. So just, I have so many thoughts. I'm going to try and do my best to organize this, get this out. Hopefully this will be congruent as to what I'm about to to communicate how this experience went. I attended two sessions on Saturday. One was a 10 a.m. morning session and then also the 2 p.m. afternoon session. But I want to understand a little bit more. So I, I changed clothes and showed up again on Sunday morning just to kind of get a better idea of what was happening outside. Walking in, I had been warned, ignore the protesters. On Saturday morning, it wasn't so bad. There were only about three or four loud ones. And the reason being is a number of them drive from New York, from what I understood. And what happened in Wyoming, if you're driving east to west, Wyoming shut down all the roads due to 60 mile per hour winds. It was just too chaotic just driving over. So uh, I got stuck, they got stuck. And by the time I returned on Sunday, it was a much more toxic, loud, um, abusive uh, type of environment from that side. And I, I've mentioned this in my book. Um, I, I kind of came from a, a similar background where I would militarize my Bible. I would highlight it like battle coordinates so that I could rain down Sodom and Gomorrah on those that were floating in sin. It took me a while to disarm that type of mindset uh, from that biblical frame. And what I find from the Book of Mormon is I don't see the members, I don't see the saints take that same approach, especially with the Book of Mormon, because there's so much focus on Jesus Christ. It's so centered on that. I think I heard somewhere there's 6,000 verses, 4,000 point to Jesus. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but hearing that statistic has just made me really ponder a little bit more about that. So with the protesters, what I actually thought is they were actually reinforcing the Book of Mormon, especially with how it begins. 
what do I mean by that? Um, I, one question I've had often is, do you still speak with your missionaries? And I do. Uh, we usually have bi-weekly phone calls. I really appreciate everything that they've been able to show me. I am not trying to convert them. I've told them I'm not necessarily being trying to be converted either. I'm just trying to learn. I just want to be curious. And early on in the Book of Mormon, you have 1 Nephi 8. And what happens in that is you have Lehi. He is like this patriarch, Abraham-like figure in Lehi's dream of dreams. Uh, it, the symbolism is just very strong. Because what happens is uh, you have this tree of life. And he calls over his family. So his wife, his two younger children partake. But the two older ones, they stay away from it. And what happens further is then you see this iron rod appear. And the tricky thing is for people to get to the tree of life, to have that fruit, they have to walk through, these, uh, through this fog, through this darkness, and they're only guided by this metal rod. Well, what happens is uh, in this dream, there's this huge type of balcony, this huge type of almost majestic kingly uh, setting of people looking down at the people that are trying to get to the tree of life. They mock, they insult, they laugh at those people that are trying to find this tree. And it can get to the point where people just fall off the path because they don't want to be insulted and criticized. Well, as on Saturday, as I'm walking in with the Latter-day Saints, it was strange because as you're walking in, you have these metal rods, you have these barricades that is guiding you in to the conference center. And it's almost like when you're walking towards this conference center, you're going there for the modern day prophet's words, his fruits, his good message. Like I was almost expecting walking in that I would see some type of tree of life type of replica uh, when I got inside. So as soon as you get inside, it's peaceful. It's exciting. It's, uh, it was just so bizarre. And I feel like with the protesters, like, I don't know, like, it sounded like they, they had a good understanding of Joseph Smith. They, they would quote some passages from the Doctrine and Covenants. But with that symbolism, with that tree, it's like, with that dream of dreams, is this like referencing this? It was so strange. With the protests, one thing that I have been wrestling with is uh, discipleship, especially when it comes to Jesus' disciples and apostles. I feel at points that there's a little bit of an apostle inside of all of us. Like, why are you following Jesus Christ? Like, what is your personality? And I think that there's a lot of Christians, a lot of Protestants, who are very much like the Sons of Thunder, you know, James and John. Uh, they have a little bit of a temper. They have these strong personalities. Uh, you have other disciples that are so defensive, uh, so passionate for the, for the gospel. It's a little bit like Simon Peter. But the worry with Simon Peter is when Jesus is being arrested, what does Peter do? He draws out his sword. He cuts off the ear of the servant. And part of being a disciple, how are you supposed to preach the good news? How are you supposed to preach the gospel if you're cutting off people's ears? How are they going to hear you? How are they going to hear the good news? And for myself, like, I'm not very confrontational. That's just never been uh, a big thing for me. I've often considered myself a little bit like Matthew. Like, uh, like I studied tax accounting, so there, that tax collector thing kind of rings true. But I'm also trying to document, learn everything that I can to see how God's hand is reaching out to others with all these church trips. With Latter-day Saints, uh, one of the, the things I, I was asked, uh, you know, what's your fascination into the Latter-day Saint movement? One thing is like my, my mind changes because I'm no longer technically Matthew. I feel much more like Downing Thomas. Uh, the first time I went to an LDS visitor center, the very first thing my eyes were drawn to was a statue of Jesus Christ. I'm looking at the hands. I'm looking at the cuts. I'm looking at the nail marks. And granted, it's a statue. It's not Jesus Christ himself. But like I'm, I'm asking, like Downing Thomas gets a bad rap, but he's asking questions. He's examining. He's trying to understand this. And that's been one thing, as I see with the protesters, like I 
feel like there's a little piece where they're coming from a good place. It's just with that approach of taking up thy sword with the protests, using their tongues as swords, like Jesus' example was to come over to that uh, Roman soldier's servant and to heal. Bring the ear back so that you could hear. So I'm still wrestling with that right now as to everything that happened outside. Inside was such a difference between outside. Uh, it was this contained excitement. It was loud, but it was more about excitement as to what everyone was going to hear. Um, I would probably say this was one of the best dressed type of church environments I've ever been a part of. Uh, a lot of young couples. Um, that's so different from today's modern society standards and expectations where I'm seeing like 20 year olds together. I know that sounds weird, but it's just due to uh, that type of culture. A lot of international influence as well. Uh, I know when I walked in and it sat down, uh, the gal to my left was from Colombia, and then those that were on my right uh, were Spanish speaking from what I could tell. So like they had all these uh, earpieces to translate whatever the elders, the quorum, whoever was speaking was actually saying from a different language perspective. Uh, so my Downing Thomas mind got working. So I started examining, going up all these different levels. And it was like this uh, artwork masterpiece gallery with all the paintings of Jesus Christ. So many paintings of Jesus Christ. Uh, there also were, um, were head busts of past LDS presidents. Uh, I saw one including with President Nelson for today's current modern day prophet slash president. And I also saw one with Joseph Smith and there were a few other artwork pieces with him. What I didn't see was anything related to the Old Testament. I didn't see anything for Abraham, Noah, Moses, David, Solomon, no, no representation from the Old Testament that I found. But they did have an entire room devoted to Book of Mormon um, stories. So there was Lehi and the ship to the Americas. There was Nephi when he um, has like the Holy Spirit kind of take hold of him in a debate against his older brothers. And there were other stories as well. I just don't know enough about the Book of Mormon to know what those were all about. Uh, but yeah, inside, like the words that came to mind, polish, structured, organized. And like it was just such a different type of uh, environment walking around that I've never seen or been a part of before. I think the biggest word was benchmark. Like they were trying to be the best one true church that they could possibly be for its members. For General Conference itself, I've had a number of people ask me, what did you think? And I don't know yet. It's, it's, it's so much that I'm not used to. So first off, uh, the actual environment, the building, uh, wow. <laughs> like, again, benchmark. Like this was pristine in how this was presented. You see the, the organ pipes uh, with the tabernacle choir all in unison as they sing is just... Wow, like it's so good. Um, one thing I've never noticed before or with a church is uh, the way that the seating was from a leadership perspective because they had uh, the President Nelson, the Quorum of Twelve Apostles facing towards the people. And then you also had what I heard was the roster. So you had something called the 70. And then they also had uh, some young men's and young women's uh, type of counselors up there. So I'm not fully knowing, understanding what the whole background and the organization is on that. But the big thing was when President Nelson walked in. It was strange because everybody was talking. And as soon as President Nelson walked in, everybody stood up and was silent. I've never heard that type of respect before for anybody. So to see that, that, that reverence, that respect, that authority uh, was eye-opening to me. And that even happened when he walked out. Everybody would stand and would be quiet again. The way each session works for General Conference, each one goes about two hours. So they start with a tabernacle choir, 
And then uh, the President Oaks or President Earring, I believe are their names, uh, they will kind of give an overview of what to expect from a, a leadership perspective on who will talk. Each talk goes for about 15 minutes. And they're, they're very different than what I'm accustomed to from other type of churches I go to because um, they're, they're shorter, 15 minutes. Uh, a lot of preachers nowadays from a Protestant perspective, like they'll go these marathon sermons. And here it's much more condensed, it's much more precise. Uh, each word is crafted. And oftentimes, especially with, with uh, his name was Elder Ochtdorf, is it? Dieter Ochtdorf? He's kind of like this German-sounding Arnold Schwarzenegger. I really like this guy. And I don't recall him quoting much scripture, but it was just so much focus on Jesus Christ and family and this kind of picture-perfect type of household. And like he had enough like sense of humor in it to keep going, but it's just so different because I'm always expecting with sermons, you're quoting all these biblical passages, you're bringing it back in a certain way. It was just a, a little tweak that I'm not accustomed to. The one talk I think that resonated the most was uh, the very first one from Elder Gary Stevenson. And uh, there's a lot that I really liked what he said because he's mentioning about um, family traditions, especially with Easter being next week. So he mentioned about with Latter-day Saints, we often celebrate with our Christian cousins, which, which I liked that terminology, for Christmas. Like we do all these different things, but you remove the Christmas story, you lose two chapters in the Bible. With e if you lose Easter, you lose the whole New Testament. And he talks, uh, and he quoted N.T. Wright, the New Testament scholar. I guess he used to be um, an Anglican priest, if I understand correctly on that. Uh, but he, he talked about the traditions, the festivals, the ways to be creative in ter terms of celebrating. So I was all like, like, what, what's going on here? Like, does anyone else know who N.T. Wright is in this conference center other than me? And so what he was able, but then he started bringing the Book of Mormon and it's like, I can't even help it. My Protestant mind has like this smoke alarm installed in it. Where it's like, I don't know if I should believe this with what he's saying now. It's it's very um, it's very interesting because there's just so much I agree with. To, there's so much that I see from the examples. I absolutely love it. And then my Protestant mind just kicks in uh, to kind of to shield away this uh, discernment aspect per se. Before we wrap up this video, uh, I should mention uh, President Russell M. Nelson. Uh, so if you're a Protestant, he is the modern-day prophet for Latter-day Saints. And, you know, as a Protestant, uh, the idea of a, a modern-day prophet, I, I become very skeptical about. Uh, but on my way over, I had a Latter-day Saint friend who recommended that I listen to his biography, uh, Insights from a Prophet's Life. So I listened to a, a big chunk of that. And it was interesting because it just provided so much new insight into who he is, uh, the grace, the respect, the heart that he contains. And as I drove over, like he was, he was instrumental. He was this pioneer for the heart lung machine. And he has really done immense work when it comes to open heart surgery. And like one story that they give in this is he's operating and I guess, uh, you know, he has a team and I guess like a, a scalpel uh, got misplaced. And I think it ended up in his forearm or someone else's forearm. I can't remember. And in that type of stressful environment, you can easily lose your emotions. And the way that it was portrayed is with President Nelson, then, you know, a doctor, uh, kind of talked about how, you know, you know, someday, you know, I love you. Some days I just love you more, <laughs> like something like that. And to see how he has reacted, his demeanor, his emotions, and then to see the outside from the Protestant perspective of the persecution and the insults and the hurls, to see how Latter-day Saints represent Jesus Christ, but also to be guided by President Nelson's own example as well, uh, was very, very interesting. And I think one of the biggest things I took away 
from that biography is uh, there's a story where he had to be where he was serving in the Korean War, part of the MASH unit, and uh, I guess they got uh, ambushed is is how the story goes, and you do a lot of thinking in in a foxhole, and he's there with another doctor who is Catholic, and um, you know he was a devout Latter Day Saint, so they're praying. They have radically different beliefs but yet they're praying to the same source. And to me, um, especially with Latter-day Saints, that, that Christian Cousins uh, type of uh, discussion from Elder Stevenson's talk, uh, that really resonated the most to me. And especially with different camps, I like to think bridges are being built right now. Um, an understanding, an acceptance of beliefs while maintaining our own convictions and beliefs in itself as well. So with President Nelson, with what he said, um, I, I didn't get to listen to the full talk. I was uh, kind of listening as I was driving to my next site, uh, but uh, there was so much about peacemaking. And I think one quote that I heard is, uh, we cannot support Satan with our verbal assaults and then think we can still serve God. And, um, you know, I, I think Seeing here, seeing this, being a part of General Conference, walking in with the Latter Day Saints, kind of seeing what, even though I don't agree with any of the toxicity or the insults that are being hurled, um, I, I'm, I'm hoping right now that we're doing something positive. And um, we're again, I with to agree with President Nelson with that biography. I, I still find myself. Like we're praying to, like I'm still doubting Thomas, but I'm still praying to the same source. Latter-day Saints praying to the same source. We're praying to Jesus Christ. And I think that from all these visits with all these 52 churches in 52 weeks, as I've examined Latter-day Saint churches, uh, that's been such a prime example of putting your faith into action. Whew, this was a long one. I hope you enjoy this week's visit to the General Conference for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Also want to give a special thanks to Rachel and Eric uh, who helped make this visit possible for me. Can't say enough good things and I hope with this video it was done respectfully and helps to build bridges. Uh, for next week, I'm not sure quite where to go yet. Uh, I have some interesting ones planned. Not sure if I'll be able to swing those or not, but if you want to stay tuned, make sure to like and subscribe. But until next time, hope you have a good one.